This is our regular Tuesday 8.30 step study meeting. My name is Jim and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Jim. Hi buddy, I'm glad to be here and glad to see all of you here. Uh, let's see, this is a closed meeting, UG, of Alcoholics Anonymous. We ask you to silence your cell phones and pagers this time and please refrain from cursing when you share. Could I please have three volunteers to clean up after the meeting? One, two, three. Good, thank you. In support of AA Singles of Purpose, attendance at closed meetings is limited to persons who have a desire to stop drinking. If you think you have a problem with alcohol, you're welcome to attend this meeting. We ask that when discussing our problems, we confine ourselves to those problems as they relate to alcoholism. You know, it's real important, whenever you hear chapter 5 being read, how it works, remember that what that last pertinent idea is saying. That's a, that's a, a real powerful thought. Uh, the three pertinent ideas tell us that we're alcoholic, can't manage our own lives, no human power is going to relieve us of our alcoholism, which means no human power can relieve us of the obsession and compulsion to drink alcohol. But that God can and will do so if we seek Him. That's a great promise. And what it comes down to is that uh, our job from here on out is to start seeking God. And you may ask, well, how do you do that? Well, that's simple enough. We have the steps. That's what the steps are there for. To take us from a place of rebellion and defiance and denial to a place of acceptance and surrender and obedience and when we have done that we find that when we get to the tenth step that the obsession and compulsion to drink alcohol is gone we've been restored to sanity and all these things are true this is exactly the way it works if you just uh, came in my name's Jim I'm an alcoholic my spry date is December 20th, 1964. I've been sober through the grace of God since that time. And I'm delighted to be here and delighted to see all of you here tonight. We're continuing our study of the, of the 12 steps. And we're in the fourth step. And we're proceeding very slowly. <laughs> but that's okay. We want to learn as we go. And uh, tonight we're going to be taking a look at uh, the list of our own wrongs and perhaps uh, our fears list. Just a little bit of a recap if you haven't been with us before. The fourth step is not designed to indict us or make us bad, make us wrong. It's designed for us to find out what's wrong with us. All we have to do is go back to uh, the paragraph which follows our third step which tells us that we must make a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which are blocking us from God. Namely, our defects of character and our guilt and our remorse and our shame. Those are things which block us from the sunlight of the Spirit. In order to do that, we must take inventory. Taking inventory is the first part of the spiritual solution to this dilemma. The dilemma is very well stated in the third step prayer. We ask God to take away our difficulties. Well, we don't know at that time in the third step what they are. We haven't done anything to find out what's wrong with us. We just know that things are dreadfully wrong. Now in the fourth step, we're going to find out what it is that we have to uh, be free of in order for us to recover. We're also going to find out what it is that we're going to carry with us into the fifth step. So that not only are we going to write these things down, but we will also be admitting them to God, to ourselves, and most especially to another person. A highly spiritual step, the fifth step, comes from great way back in antiquity. And it's something which is an absolute must. 
But first we have to find out what it is that's wrong with us before we can do our fifth step. So that, in the fourth step, that's what we're going to do. A lot of people have a lot of confusion about what is meant by a defect of character. There's no confusion in the big book. Confusion comes out of the 12 and 12 and a lot of other literature, but the big book is quite clear. The defects of character which we're looking for are set forth in the fourth step, again in the tenth step, and again in the eleventh step. Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And from these stem all sorts of other problems. All sorts of things about ourselves that we find that we don't like or that are harmful to us, usually revolving around actions that we take but actions that we take are only indicative of the defect of character. They are not the defect itself. And so when we work our fourth step, we're looking for these four defects. We start out with the resentments. And we have a whole section of the fourth step which is devoted to uncovering what our resentments are and why we have them identifying the people whom we resent and then before we move on the big book gives us the complete spiritual answer to be set free from resentment remember what bill wilson said somebody asked him how do i know if i did a proper four step he said if you have any resentments left when you finish you didn't do it right and so many of our <coughs> More modern people, our new AJAers, are not even aware of this. Somehow they think that we're supposed to talk ourselves out of having a resentment. But we find, and we discussed this at length last week and the week before, that when we look at our resentments, we're looking precisely to see who has harmed us and what did they do because we're going to pray for them when we have our complete list and we're going to ask God to make us willing to forgive the harm they did and the actions they took. What happens is that we get set free from our resentments. Maybe not all at once but it does and sometimes we're going to have to pray for maybe weeks. Some resentments are so deep-seated they don't just go away right away, but they will, provided we're willing to do <clears throat> what we must do in order to be set free from them. Keep in mind, the big book is right when it tells us this, that we cannot wish our resentments away any more than alcohol. In other words, what it's really telling us is that we're as powerless over resentment as we are over alcohol. We need God's help with it, and we can have that help. First, we have to identify quite clearly, not only the resentment, but what caused it. The second part of the fourth step is a review of our own wrongs. And it begins our eight step list, which is done in the fourth step, at least substantially completed. And so in our second part of our fourth step, we're going to see what we did to harm others and we're looking to see whom we've harmed and what we did but especially now remember that the fourth step is looking for these four cardinal defects we've already looked at our resentments now in the second part we're going to be looking at dishonesty selfishness and fear and so the questions which are posed to us to answer in the second part of our fourth step go directly to those points the big book, the, the, the four step in the big book is a rapier. It goes right to these points. It's not a broadsword. It is by no means a, an autobiography. It is, not, it is not worked by answering 497 questions propounded by some psych major. We go directly to the point. We follow the directions in the big book and it works. When we have finished with our catalog of our wrongs and the people we've harmed then we will go take a look at our fears we make a list of our fears and what we believe the cause was and the big book gives us therefore the solution 
to our fears. Now keep in mind that the that uh, modern thought is something along the lines of you've got to learn to walk through your fears and this kind of stuff. The big book says, wait a second, there's a spiritual solution to fear. Here, let us show you what it is. Remember that the big book is a history. It is telling us what the people who wrote the book did. This is what they did to be set free from fear. And so we learn in that, in the fears portion of our four step, how to be set free from fear through the use of a spiritual remedy for fear. This is continued over into the fifth step. By the time we finish the fifth step, we have, a, we have attained a complete spiritual answer to our fears. Then finally, the fourth part of the fourth step is our uh, sexual inventory. And that inventory is designed to illustrate and point out in great detail uh, in stereophonic Dolby widescreen everything <laughs> our dishonesties and our selfishness in our relationships with others especially our sex relations and so we get a complete look through the the four parts of the four step at all four of these defects Finally, when we have completed our writing, then we're going to compile a list of all the people we've harmed and for whom we have become willing to make amends. And that's done in our fourth step. And then we will compile a list of our defects of character. And we carry all of this forward into our fifth step. So if we look at the fifth, fourth step from this standpoint, then we get we get five things that we know ought to come out of a properly done four step. We're going to lose our resentments. We're going to begin to lose our fears. We're going to have an ideal for our future sex life. We're going to have a list of all the people we've harmed and a list of our defects of character. Okay, we're going to be uh, we're going to be starting chapter eight tonight. This is an incredible chapter, and, and it, it's you know if you if you had a thousand dollar bill and you wanted to save keep it, you would just stick it in chapters of wives, and nobody'd ever find it. You'd probably forget where it was too. But the chapter to wives is very very important. It contains material that we find nowhere else. Not only do we find nowhere else in, in the big book, we find nowhere else in AA literature. And we're going to see that as we go along. You know, as we've been working the big book together and reading it and uh, considering it as we go, one of, the, one of the themes which continues to pulse through all of this has to do with, uh, I guess you would say, first step, but more really the basics and one of the things that we always have to do when when we're in recovery is to remember that we go back to basics to find answers and the basics of our disease and the basics of our program are really pretty simple and they need we need to repeat them to ourselves and keep them in mind and I, I wanted to share something with you that Bill wrote uh, which has to do with his adventure through that first step and finding out what the, the basics of recovery are. And also, we do a lot of talking around here about how frustrating it must be for those of the medical profession, the psychiatric profession, the counselors, and, and even the priests, ministers, and rabbis are trying to get us sober. And they seldom have any success at all. Okay, to wives, chapter 8. With few exceptions, our book thus far has spoken of men. We have, what we have said applies quite as much to women. Our activities in behalf of women who drink are on the increase. 
There's every evidence that women be, regain their health as readily as men if they try our suggestions. Well, surprise, surprise. I guess these guys are such chauvinists, they were surprised to find that women were human beings too. I'm not sure they're right, but they probably are. <laughs> For every man who drinks, others are involved. The wife who trembles in fear of the next debauch. Anybody here wonder what a debauch is? Debauchery. Debauch. Debauchery. You don't often hear that word anymore, do we? That's getting stinking drunk. A next debauch. The mother and father who see their son wasting away. Among us are wives, relatives, and friends whose problem has been solved, as well as some who have not yet found a happy solution. We want the wives of Alcoholics Anonymous to address the wives of men who drink too much. What they say will apply to nearly everyone bound by ties of blood or affection to an alcoholic. As wives of Alcoholics Anonymous, we would like you to feel that we understand as perhaps few can. We want to analyze the mistakes we've made. We want to leave you with the feeling that no situation is too difficult and no unhappiness too great to be overcome. Wow, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? You know, one of the main themes of this chapter is as we read it, you, you need to be aware of what's going on here. Um, Bill's really leading up to this, that you, wife, can have a happy, productive life in spite of the fact that you're married to a damn drunk who is, who is not recovering and he's always been causing all kinds of difficulty and you don't need to, it doesn't need to have to be that way. You can have a reasonably happy life on your own. But when you think about that, think about what's going here. This dependency which the wives had developed on their alcoholic <coughs> husbands was that one thing which was causing them most of their pain. And what the chapter advocates is a breaking away from that dependency. And as you will see, the, re the way that that's done primarily is for the wives to work the steps. You say, oh, well, wait a minute. They're supposedly, they're not alcoholics. How can they, how many work the steps? They're not alcoholic. Well, that's a, a very common misunderstanding. Anybody, any human being can work the steps. They're for everybody. They're not just for alcoholics and the occasional drug addict who wanders in here. They're for everybody. Why? Well, it's simple. The 12 steps are great spiritual principles applicable to every human being restated as steps of action, which means quite simply that if we learn to take that action, we will incorporate those spiritual principles into our very being. They become the way we live our lives. And every human being gains immeasurably from that. I've taken quite a few people through the steps who are not alcoholics. And those who had the courage and the motivation to actually face themselves, as we have to do, they've done quite well. It's changed their lives just as it changes our lives. So they got the same problems we have, they just don't drink over them. And so as we read this chapter, we're going to see a, an appeal to the wives to break loose from this terrible dependency that they developed on their on their husbands, and the expectations which they have developed, which are constantly being thwarted and frustrated, and to begin to live their lives standing on their own two feet. In effect, it's saying, leave the rascal alone. Let him do whatever the hell he's going to do. You don't have to be sick because he's sick. It's a pretty interesting theory, isn't it? There's nothing in here that is to instruct the wife what she's to do to get this guy sober or to change him. 
because it's clear that she can't change it. She hasn't got any power to do that any more than he has to do it for himself. So the subject here is her. How do you and the kids survive this illness in your house with a certain amount of grace and happiness? And this chapter is designed to show her exactly how to do that. So we keep that in mind too as we read it. And so he says here, we want to leave you with the feeling that no situation is too difficult and no unhappiness too great to be overcome. We have traveled a rocky road, there is no mistake about that. We've had long rendezvous with hurt, pride, frustration, self-pity, misunderstanding, and fear. These are not pleasant companions. He does not mean there that it's only on the part of the husband who is exhibiting these things, but that they affected the wife as well. She has been caught up in pride, frustration, self-pity, misunderstanding, and fear. We have been driven to maudlin sympathy, to bitter resentment. Some of us have veered from extreme to extreme, ever hoping that one day our loved ones would be themselves once more. Our loyalty and the desire that our husbands hold up their heads and be like other men have begotten all sorts of predicaments. We've been unselfish and self-sacrificing. <coughs> oh my. We have told innumerable lies to protect our pride and our husband's reputations. Notice that Bill puts their pride first before the reputation of their husband, and that's true. And he's going right to the heart of motivations here. I'm going to tell the lie because I don't want anybody to know what I'm married to, or how stupid of me to stay with him, or how could I have made such a terrible mistake in the first place. We have prayed, we have begged, we have been patient. We have struck out viciously. We've run away. We've been hysterical. We've been terror stricken. We've sought sympathy and we've had retaliatory love affairs with other men. There's some guys, you know, when they read this, they say, well, I wonder, wonder where these wives are. <laughs> Yeah, this must be one of those uh, fringe benefits of being in the program. I suppose we could start a new fellowship, Retaliators Anonymous. <laughs> Our homes have been battlegrounds many an evening. In the morning we have kissed and made up. Our friends have counseled chucking them in and we've done so with finality only to be back in a little while, hoping, always hoping. Our men have sworn great solemn oaths that they were through drinking forever. We believed them when no one else could or would. Then in days, weeks, or months, a fresh outburst. Why did you go back to that song? <coughs> but I love him. <laughs> We seldom had friends at our homes, never knowing how or when the men of the house would appear. We could make few social engagements. We came to live almost alone. When we were invited out, our husbands sneaked so many drinks that they spoiled the occasion. If on the other hand, they took nothing, their self-pity made them kill joys. See what's happening here? In talking to the wives, this chapter is describing their husbands. Why is that so important for us to keep, I, I keep harping on this, because this is, this is flat, first step material. This is the kind of thing that the newcomer coming in needs to read. Some of you wonder, why does Jim always say you gotta read the whole book when you come in new? Well, looky here, this is stuff you don't find anywhere else in this book. It's a description of us. 
This is the kind of stuff that we begin to identify ourselves with. This is what helps us break down the walls of denial.